Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Today we have Anatoly Bikovsky with us from Princeton. Uh, let's see, he got his PhD from UC Berkeley and then was a Chandra Fellow at uh, Stanford uh, Cali Institute for something. <laughs> Particle astrophysics and cosmology. I did none of those things. Yes. That's right. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I always uh, find it amusing to count how many times I'm going to go around the hall to find the right office. When I emerge on a random floor, it's, we go right or left. <laughs> Uh, so uh, my topic today is um, shock acceleration uh, and um, things we've learned about this in the last few years uh, by doing uh, ab initio kinetic simulations where we track uh, all components of the plasma uh, in a computer simulation. And um, uh, so the goal is to show you uh, a few of the results and a few emerging conclusions that are coming out of these simulations. So um, the Things that I'm interested in generally have to do with non-thermal uh, particles, and uh, one of the ways non-thermal particles manifest themselves is through non-thermal radiation. So we have many sources of non-thermal radiation, typically showing up as synchrotron radiation, where uh, relativistic particles are uh, presumably gyrating in magnetic field and uh, emitting these uh, uh, multi-band uh, power laws. So uh, here's a typical example of a supernova remnant. So all of this colorful stuff is uh, thermal emission from uh, X-ray lines. But that, what I'm interested in are these blue things. Typically, non-thermal emission is shown in blue colors for some reason. Uh, and uh, you can see there is some uh, interesting correlation between these blue colors and uh, the periphery of the remnant, which is presumably where the shock is. So we find this correlation always uh, between non-thermal particles and some sort of shock phenomenon. Uh, you can see it in spectra over here. Uh, this is the thermal Bremsstrahlung. This is non-thermal. And um, uh, in supernova remnants, uh, electrons can get uh, up to 100 TeV energies. Uh, that's what we infer. Uh, presumably, these objects also accelerate particles, uh, which are ions, protons, which are uh, less obvious how to see. But uh, they do show up, ultimately, as cosmic rays. And uh, presumably, uh, these uh, galactic supernova remnants are supposed to accelerate protons up to uh, uh, PEV energies. Uh, <coughs> moving on to uh, other sources, we have uh, relativistic jets, uh, which uh, uh, have gamma factors on the order of uh, a few to 10. Uh, and uh, they uh, emit a radio emission uh, when these jets uh, collide with the interstellar medium, uh, they all intercluster medium, really. and. Uh, uh, they also uh, emit uh, emission along the jet. Uh, and you can see here again uh, multi-decade uh, wavelengths in, in uh, frequency power laws. Uh, uh, <clears throat> again, electrons uh, are accelerated somehow uh, along these uh, structures or maybe in, in shocks that are produced uh, at the termination of these jets. Uh, a more extreme example is pulsar wind nebulae. Here, gamma factors can reach, uh, bulk gamma factors can reach uh, uh, up to 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 6. Uh, so here, a rapidly spinning pulsar is, sp is throwing away uh, relativistic wind, which comes to a shock when it uh, comes into a ram pressure balance with the pressure in the uh, surrounding nebula. And uh, presumably, this shock accelerates particles. <laughs> And uh, you can see multi-frequency uh, multi uh, broadband uh, power loss. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's many other examples of these pulsar wind nebulae, all showing up non-thermal emission, uh, which comes from uh, uh, these uh, relativistic particles. Uh, as I mentioned, there's big power law in the sky in protons uh, or, or other nuclei, uh, which uh, shows up as cosmic rays. And, um, the, um, there is, uh, it's a simple power law on the one hand. If you start plotting it with different uh, scalings, you can see all sorts of interesting features in the power law. And ultimately, the goal is to understand all of these little features, like this knee, the ankle, and uh, the cutoff, uh, if there is one, at ultra-high energy, uh, at, at ultra-high energy. So um, this uh, 
diagram shows many common examples. One, one I didn't mention, uh, this is fairly recent in the last decade or so, uh, discovery of uh, radio relics in galaxy clusters, uh, which are presumably megaparsec scale uh, shocks. Uh, and uh, they show up in uh, non-thermal uh, radio emission as uh, efficient radiators from uh, relativistic electrons. So uh, they also show very coherent magnetic field structures, which seem to be spread over uh, megaparsec scale. So uh, closer to home, we have examples in the heliosphere, like heliospheric shocks, uh, which are, can be actually probed in situ by uh, satellites. Uh, they're slightly less... Uh, extreme, their Mach numbers are smaller than Mach numbers we encounter in interstellar medium, uh, yet they're there to probe and, and to learn from. Uh, so what we find is that when we look at all of this agglomeration of shocks, uh, they're all shocks in different environments, different Lorentz factors, different magnetic fields, yet in many cases they manage to do these three things amazingly well. So they manage to somehow accelerate particles to power loss, uh, as they do that, we've, we infer that they also uh, amplify magnetic fields. So uh, the, the fields in uh, supernova remnants, for example, are inferred to be on the order of um, hundreds microgauss, 100 microgauss, and uh, that's way more than you would expect from just compression from an interstellar medium. Uh, presumably, the acceleration of particles is associated with amplification of magnetic field. And how this happened is a very interesting process that we want to understand. Uh, also, uh, shocks manage to uh, exchange energy between electrons and ions, or rather ions and electrons. Uh, a typical uh, simple shock which has, uh, if you think about the energy that electrons bring into the shock energy or the ions bring to the shock, if they were just to equilibrate to, to their own initial uh, energy, you would expect that electrons will be much colder than the ions. Uh, they don't carry as much kinetic energy uh, in the upstream flow. So, uh, what we find is that equilibration between these species is much faster than you would expect from just Coulomb collisions. So some sort of uh, microscopic physics that happens at shocks is uh, doing this. Uh, so the, the obvious question is how and, and how this proceeds and when does this proceed and what can we learn about this? So, so this is microscopic processes and not collective phenomena that transfer energy? <laughs> That's what I mean, right. So microscopic and collective in this case will be the same thing. <laughs> because a collective plasma phenomena happen on small scale. Uh, so one distinguishing feature about these shocks uh, in the astrophysics is that they're quite different from shocks uh, on Earth. So uh, a typical shock on Earth has a thickness which is about one mean free path of collisions between oxygen uh, molecules. Uh, and uh, these shocks are typically micron scale. Uh, in case of the uh, astrophysical plasmas, uh, the densities are so low, the velocities are so high that the uh, binary collisions take uh, a good part of the macroscopic size of the object. So a mean free pass in a supernova remnant can be as big as the supernova remnant. Uh, in a galaxy cluster, it's a, like a, a quarter of the galaxy cluster. So uh, relying on Coulomb collisions to mediate shocks is uh, going to be uh, difficult. Yet we do see very sharp structures. So some other process has to take place. And uh, what happens is that uh, these collective phenomena due to plasma physics are uh, mediating these shocks. And we call them collision-less shocks. So uh, <clears throat> the basic process that leads to acceleration, I just have to review this, is uh, Fermi acceleration, uh, where um, so Fermi in 49 proposed this idea that uh, if a particle could scatter off uh, moving clouds, then on average it will see more likely clouds going towards each other than clouds uh, receding from each other. So there would be some net energy gain. And it, is indeed, it does indeed work. It turns out to be second order in velocity of the cloud divided by uh, speed of light. So it's fairly slow process. Uh, it does happen. But in the late 70s, it was realized that uh, at shocks, you actually can have a persistent convergent flow. So uh, the problem with clouds is that sometimes they go away. In the shock, uh, if you're sitting in the downstream and you're looking towards the upstream, upstream is coming towards you. If you're looking from this upstream side, the downstream is going towards you. So there's always a net compression. And if you could manage to bounce between the upstream and the downstream, you could uh, gain significant amount of energy. The, uh, this was worked out uh, in the 70s and now called diffusive shock acceleration. This uh, idea is very elegant and it can predict a power law 
uh, formation in the form that depends, the power index depends on the compression at the shock. And uh, <coughs> for a strong shock, it predicts a power law of about e to the minus 2, uh, which is a very uh, good power law to explain cosmic rays, for example, and, and explain many cases of synchrotron radiation. Um, the thing that this uh, model um, assumes is that uh, particles could scatter off some of uh, magnetic field fluctuations, and that's what brings those particles back across the, the shock. Uh, the existence of these fluctuations at the right uh, level is not guaranteed. Uh, also, it's not clear how many particles actually participate in this process. So, uh, in principle, this theory can predict the power loss shape, but it cannot predict the normalization of the power loss. So, some shocks could have zero uh, as a prefactor uh, in this power law. So uh, it turns out that in order to understand this, you need to understand the actual microphysics of what's going on in the shock transition, and that's what we're, uh, what we're after. Uh, the difficulty here is that um, there are these three ingredients that go in. One is the shock structure uh, on a micro scale, scale of the Larmor radius of a particle. Uh, or smaller. Uh, then there is uh, magnetic turbulence, then there is particle acceleration. So uh, it turns out that all of these three things are intrinsically interdependent and uh, you can't only solve the shock structure and not worry about particle acceleration because at some point particle acceleration will feed back on the shock structure through generating magnetic turbulence and so forth. So this kind of uh, uh, unbreakable triangle that we have to work with, the difficulty is that this, is, uh, uh, this can happen on small scale, this can happen on large scale. So you, you end up coupling small scales and large scales uh, in, the, in your simulation. Basically, an, a simple hydrodynamic shock, which is just a discontinuity, uh, which on the inside has some sort of ugly plasma physics happening, some sort of instabilities that actually mediate this transition, it can trans, uh, it can transition into this kind of a broad structure where cosmic rays are being accelerated, their mean free pass is large, their gyrations are large, they're diffusing around the shock. They can go microscopic distances into the upstream and the downstream, change the magnetic field, and ultimately change the shock. So these cosmic ray modified shocks are extremely important in the case where you're putting a lot of energy into, co into cosmic rays. And that's what we're ultimately trying to, to capture. So the methods that we use for this are uh, what we call kinetic simulation. So there are two kinds. Uh, one is uh, called the particle in cell method. So this is a method which uh, uh, discretizes the plasma as a lot of particles. So there are positive particles and negative particles in the plasma. Uh, and uh, we're just tracking particles on the grid. So if you're doing n-body simulations, we're uh, kind of your uh, friends with uh, uh, different uh, uh, you know, with positive and negative masses, if you will. Uh, so we have both kinds of charts. That's the difference between non-body simulation and plasma simulations. Uh, so we have particles defined on the grid. Uh, as they, uh, they, they feel the Lorentz force from electromagnetic quantities interpolated to the location of the particle. As particles move, uh, they are depositing their current. Uh, the current is used as a source for Maxwell's equations. You solve the uh, Maxwell's equation will get updated electromagnetic fields, and you can move the particles again, and this, gets, this can proceed. So this is, a, uh, this is guaranteed to work, and it works. The difficulty is extremely expensive. Uh, you end up pushing billions of particles, and your resolution is limited by plasma scales. So the skin depth of the plasma, which is C divided by omega p, is roughly needs to be resolved on the grid, and the plasma frequency has to be resolved in time step. So uh, otherwise, it can go unstable. So uh, this works, but it's, uh, it's difficult. Uh, a uh, step up to accelerate your progress is to use what we call a hybrid approach, uh, which uh, uses uh, kinetic uh, particles for protons, but electrons are treated as a neutralizing fluid. So for uh, electrons, contribution is just to provide an effective electric field, which we use in Ohm's law uh, to, to provide electric field based on the proton densities. Uh, but uh, this ignores physics of the electrons mostly, uh, so you don't need to track them, and uh, this increases your possible size of the simulation, so, uh, so it's less expensive, but at the expense of the throwing away some physics. Okay, so what we've been doing is uh, kind of a survey of collisionless shocks where uh, we uh, try to set everything uh, in a similar way and then vary some, vary some parameters, so we have a typical our simulations have this reflecting wall, we throw a flow at the reflecting wall, 
and then uh, this balanced flow moves this way. Uh, this creates a shock, and um, we can vary the composition of the flow, the velocity of the flow, the uh, magnetization of the flow, the presence of magnetic field or absence of it, its direction, etc. And uh, what we've been uh, finding is um, uh, when shocks accelerate, when they do not accelerate. Uh, so what we found so far is that we've seen evidence of these uh, processes in relativistic shocks. And my first part, I will describe some of the highlights from the relativistic shocks. And uh, in the recent years, we've been going more towards non-relativistic shocks and trying to uh, 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 qu quantify the presence of this diffusive shock acceleration in, uh, in a non-relativistic case, both for ions and now for electrons as well. Uh, in the process, we're tracking uh, how field amplification works and uh, what kind of instabilities are doing this. So uh, roughly speaking, there are two ways uh, to mediate a, a shock. So uh, the, simplest, well, the simplest situation, imagine that you have no magnetic field at all. Uh, if you just have no magnetic field, you just have, imagine, two clouds of neutral plasma trying to go through each other. Uh, if there are no collisions, they would just keep going through. Uh, it seems like there would, there would be nothing that stops them, except, of course, uh, it's free energy source, so plasma will find a way to tap free energy. And indeed, there are instabilities that arise from these counter streaming flows. And those instabilities can uh, create randomly looking magnetic fields that will scatter your particles and that will slow them down and uh, create a compression. So basically, the, uh, without an initial magnetic field, or if the initial magnetic field is very low, uh, you will be uh, creating a shock on self-generated magnetic fields, uh, which will look turbulent, and particles will kind of meander in this turbulent field. If you have larger magnetic fields, and there's some threshold above which you need those magnetic fields to be, uh, the, if the fields are strong enough initially, then uh, typically the orbit of the particle in front of the shock will look like a straight line. After the shock, the magnetic field goes up. The E cross B drift is now uh, uh, changing its character, and par particles start to gyrate in this E cross B drift like this. On average, this slows down the bulk velocity of the flow. Uh, so uh, the typical transition is alphanic Mach numbers. Alphanic Mach number more than 100 is giving you this uh, Weibull-type filamentation, and uh, less than 100, it's a magnetized shock. I don't understand the, uh, the, the, the sketch. Yeah. If the yeah. this direction, then there should be a gradient of the magnetic field in the uh, vertical direction. <coughs> in this direction. Uh, so this flow is coming in this way. So what I didn't plot is that because this flow is moving this way and there's magnetic field like this, that means that there is a, uh, let's see, there is electric field, right, uh, which is pointing that way, right? And as you go through the shock, the electric field is continuous but the magnetic field is compressed. So um, that results in this curl B motion. I mean, uh, E cross B motion. OK, so uh, the basic uh, instability for these uh, uh, unmagnetized flows, this is called Weibull instability. Uh, and um, the diagram looks like this. So if you imagine two flows going through each other, you have uh, electrons from both, uh, both flows. Uh, if you Imagine a small fluctuation of magnetic field. Uh, this magnetic field will deflect particles this way. This will create uh, currents uh, so that you now have more right-going particles in here, more left-going particles in here. This segregates plasma into chunks of current. This current amplifies magnetic field that was there, uh, that, that initial perturbation that, uh, that started the whole process. This is uh, an exponential instability. So this. Uh, Amplification, uh, it's a little fluctuation amplifies itself. And uh, that's a recipe for expansion and stability. Uh, OK, so let's go. All right. OK, so uh, the main parameter that we find uh, that distinguishes the different uh, mediation mechanisms has to do with uh, alphanic Mach number or magnetization of the flow. And uh, it can be written like this. It's B squared over the kinetic energy uh, of the flow. Gamma here is the bulk gamma factor. Uh, and uh, this has something to do with inverse alphanic Mach number squared. Or you can rephrase it as skin depth over the Larmor radius of the particle. Uh, and um, what we find is that we can roughly partition, uh, you know, make a two-axis plot of different uh, environments where uh, 
on this axis we plot magnetization. Uh, so the higher on this axis, the stronger is the magnetic field compared to the uh, bulk energy of the flow. Uh, and uh, the solar wind shocks are over here. They're high magnetization, low alphanic Mach number. Uh, the supernova remnants are over here, about uh, 10 to minus 3 magnetization. Then there are shocks in galaxy clusters, which are, have uh, a range of magnetization. We really don't know all of them, but fields are presumably weaker. Uh, then there are relativistic shocks. On this axis, I'm plotting the gamma beta of the flow. So on this axis, uh, over here, I have relativistic shocks. And pulsar wind nebulae and, and AGN jets are over here. This arrow indicates uncertainty in our parameters. And gamma ray burst exist. External shocks are probably very weakly magnetized. So uh, these, uh, uh, what we find is that in this region, uh, we have uh, shocks mediated by magnetic reflection. Uh, and in this region, uh, we have shocks mediated by Weibull instability, this uh, uh, turbulent uh, magnetic field generation. So here's an example. This is a relativistic shock. Uh, this is, uh, so the box is expanding this way. My right wall is moving to the side. It injects flow uh, towards the left. This is a reflecting wall. This is density of the plasma. And you can see a formation of a jump in density. Here, this is the integrated density. This uh, jump propagates from left to right. And uh, you can see uh, the magnetic energy that is uh, in this, uh, going through the shock. You can see these filamentary magnetic fields. Uh, the magnetic energy rises to a peak in, right in the middle of the shock, and then it falls off behind the shock. And um, uh, all of this magnetic energy is self-generated. So there was no, nothing, nothing put in by hand in the upstream. All of this magnetic field rose just to create a shock, and then it starts to dissipate afterwards. So it, it, uh, it disappears in the downstream. Yes? System yeah. System. Yes, yes. We, we have a, the way out of this is particle acceleration. So uh, if, you, if you evolve this for, very, for much longer, there will be energetic particles that create fluctuations on larger scales. And then those scales are frozen into the plasma, and they, they just survive for longer distance. That's, uh, it, it's very difficult to simulate, but it's possible, I think. We, we have some hints of this, but it, it's very difficult to know. So then fair to say that there should be a, some correlation between magnetic field and strength in a GRP shock and the shape of its uh, spectrum, the, the slope of the spectrum? No. No, it's, it's ju just to... Uh, why would there be? Well, I'll, I'll... Okay, we should... We should okay. Uh, all right, so... Um, to the frame, in the frame of the shock? Yes. So would it be better? Because it would need a much smaller box to do the calculation. It's, it wouldn't be that much smaller. I mean, um, for this is gamma factor of 15. Uh, and the, the wall frame is not very different from the shock frame. Uh, <coughs> If you want to do it in the upstream frame, then, you're, then you have a problem, because this density will be gamma squared times larger. So, so then, then you'll have a, a, a horrible problem. Uh, OK, so this is what these uh, fields look like in, uh, in three dimensions. They're filamentary. Uh, in cross-section, they look like loops that are uh, evolving and ultimately uh, reconnecting and, and decaying. Uh, the, the cool thing is that uh, there are particles that are uh, not just going through the shock. So this, this shows some orbits of individual particles. Most of them are going to the left, but there are some that are going in the wrong directions. So like these, these guys are moving in the, uh, like salmon, they're, they're going upstream. And um, they show up in phase space. So if you plot the momentum of the particle in the x direction versus uh, where it is, so this is the shock. Uh, you can see here, this is the incoming flow. This is the thermal flow in the downstream. And these are escaping particles. So this is a returning stream of particles going towards the upstream. And they are the ones that are initiating this instability that is going to create the shock. And uh, if you evolve this for a, for a long time, you find that there is a power law that develops in the downstream. So this, this process naturally leads to a particle 
accelerated spectrum the, that looks like a power law with an exponential cutoff. As you run this longer in time, exponential cutoff is, is moving to the right. So, it, so it shock continues to accelerate to higher energies. Uh, this puts about 10% uh, of energy into accelerated particles. Uh, the power law spectrum is about minus 2.4 for this relativistic case. So it looks like the, the process kind of works. And if you, if you trace a particular uh, lucky particle, it does something like this. So it, it, uh, it bounces off the shock, goes back upstream, and now it has too much energy to just go back and forth uh, along the shock. It, the ones that survive go kind of sideways. They, they kind of skim the shock, and uh, this way they increase their probability of uh, scatter. Uh, and you can see it grows fatter and, uh, uh, and um, as, it, as it accelerates. <coughs> so this, this shows just this, the size of the gamma factor. <coughs> All right, so that's uh, roughly what happens with unmagnetized shocks. Uh, of course, uh, it's interesting what happens when you have finite magnetic fields. And uh, this is where things become um, more interesting. So you have uh, critical, critical angle of the magnetic field uh, above which uh, nothing happens. Uh, so if the magnetic field is inclined above a certain angle uh, with respect to the direction of the uh, flow or the normal to the shock, then those shocks don't accelerate anything. So here you can see an example of about 75 degree inclination. This is the upstream uh, incoming stream. There are no returning particles. And this shock is uh, just producing beautiful Maxwell ends. There is no acceleration. Uh, on the other hand, if we put magnetic field along the direction of the flow, uh, you can see just from the phase space, you already can figure out that this is going to be an accelerating shock. It has particles returning back. There are positive momentum particles coming back. And uh, in magnetic field, you can see some waves that are being created in front of the shock. And uh, that's, what's, uh, that's what it looks like. So here is a particle going through a quasi-parallel shock This ma when magnetic field is almost along the normal of the flow. And these waves here are self-generated. They weren't there to begin with. This is the out-of-plane magnetic field. And uh, this, these par accelerated particles are creating circularly polarized waves that are going towards the shock. And they, those waves trap the particles and result in acceleration. And uh, this is what's shown here. So this is unmagnetized case. This is the spectra for magnetized case. And uh, you can see here, this is the quasi-parallel case. As you incline the field, you get a little bit more acceleration because actually acceleration becomes faster up to a point. There is a critical angle above which everything shuts off. And what's happening here is that that angle is roughly 34 degrees divided by gamma in the, in the, proper, uh, in the observer frame. Uh, and um, <clears throat> what's going on is that uh, above a certain angle, even a particle moving at the speed of light wouldn't be able to outrun the shock. So these shocks are called superluminal. And uh, this is about 34 degrees. Uh, and uh, you can see here, this is the quasi-parallel. It's about 30 degrees, and then more than that, nothing happens. So there will be a restriction on the kind of magnetic geometries you can tolerate for relativistic shocks if you uh, um, want to accelerate particles. And this puts some uh, kind of constraints on where, uh, w which... Very quickly, over the magnetization, surely it has something to do with that, too. Sorry? What, what? Must be a limit to the yes, 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 so, so yeah, right, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in the next slide. So, so here's my diagram. Uh, this is where we find Fermi acceleration in uh, unmagnetized shocks. This is where we find acceleration in quasi-parallel shocks and not much in the quasi-perpendicular shock. We also find efficient energy uh, partition between electrons and ions, which I haven't shown, but uh, it's part of the relativistic uh, picture. Now, if we just to take this at face value and apply it, what, what would we conclude? Uh, at first, we thought that these problems with quasi-perpendicular shocks would just go away if we played more with it. They don't, they don't seem to go away. Uh, no matter what we do, they, it seems to be a robust conclusion. So uh, for pulsar wind nebulae, uh, at face value, it's a disaster because pulsar wind nebulae have a very nice toroidal magnetic field. And uh, that should kill any acceleration of the shock. Right? Uh, well, the good thing, as you mentioned, is that uh, I have a parameter of a magnetization which I, which I can play with. So if magnetization is lower than some threshold, 
then even quasi-perpendicular shocks will be mediated by this uh, Weibull type instabilities. And indeed, in the equatorial region of a pulsar wind, uh, where the waves, uh, where the, the pulsar wind does this dance of uh, uh, striped, uh, alternating direction stripes, uh, that's where the magnetization is, uh, can become low because magnetic field can probably reconnect at the shock or before the shock, and that's probably where you can uh, still have acceleration. So probably that the, it, it puts a limit on how magnetized you can be in the equatorial region of a pulsar wind. Um, for AGN jets, the problem is that uh, if you have uh, presumably shocks in the jet itself, if there are some hot spot uh, or some some uh, uh, forget knots right in the, in the jet, uh, then uh, presumably those are driven by toroidal field. They have toroidal field in them. And uh, just direct shock acceleration in such case would be disfavored. So you have to come up with some other alternatives, uh, either dissipate the magnetic field somehow, maybe there are alternating polarity loops, uh, or uh, perhaps field can get reoriented close to the edge of the jet due to some sort of uh, a shear or, or sheath at the, at the side. Uh, so that's, we're forced to come up with uh, additional scenarios in that case. Uh, otherwise, uh, or, or the gamma factors are not as high. So maybe, maybe you can have gamma factors that are smaller than 15, then the parameter space of uh, geometries enlarges. Uh, for GRBs, uh, the low magnetization external shocks seem to work quite well. So uh, self-generated Weibull turbulence uh, seems to accelerate particles quite efficiently. As, as Chris mentioned, there is an issue of how long this field survives behind the shock. And, uh, the extrapolation of what we're seeing seems to suggest that it probably will survive based if, if it's sufficient accelerator of particles. Um, we've not been able to actually demonstrate this conclusively. It, it requires a much more uh, elaborate simulation. I, I, yeah, just, just to get back quickly, you know, if you have like minus 2.4 expecting that complex interest in uh, alarm or radii comparable R over gamma square, that's a big change in particle energy, right? So, yeah. That's actually the energy density. If magnetic energy density scales in particle energy density, you're going down the, the power law tail a fair number of decades, and, and do you have enough magnetic energy left? Uh, I mean, it's a quantitative question, it sounds like. Right. And uh, so the 2.4 that we're seeing is, uh, I would say, it's early time spectrum. So. I'm not sure if it will evolve, become flat or more than like 2.2 that's un uh, analytically predicted. So that's, a, that's always the, the danger here, right? We're, what we're seeing is what first comes out of the computer, right? We haven't run it as long as we, uh, we probably should have. Um, and it's not obvious that we can, right? It, it's, uh, this process takes forever. I mean, it, 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 we're, we're on, our scales on the computer are much tinier than uh, what, what's possible in reality. Uh, we need to extrapolate. So, um, okay, so let's talk about non-relativistic shocks. So here um, we, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned, we have uh, observational constraints on uh, how much uh, energy goes into uh, cosmic rays. So we, we expect about 10% of energy of supernovae to go into uh, cosmic rays. Uh, we see 100 TeV electrons accelerated in these shocks, and we can infer the magnetic field from the thickness of the rims, how long it takes for these electrons to cool. So we can estimate how strong these magnetic fields are. Uh, also, we have measurements of electron to ion temperature equilibration in this case. The problem with non-relativistic shock acceleration is that uh, electrons and ions have very disparate uh, alarmer radii. So if you can accelerate ions, which are presumably the size of the, the Larmor radius is the size of the shock transition. For electrons, it will be much harder because they're much more, uh, their Larmor radii are much uh, smaller. So let's first look at what these shocks just look like when you run them with spec simulations. So uh, here I'm showing a density profile. This is the momentum space. So what you can see, this is an incoming flow that sees a shock jump and the ions are starting to gyrate. Uh, and uh, this density kind of follows the density of the ions. You can see that whenever you have a turning point in the ions, you see a spike in density. 
uh, magnetic field follows density roughly. Uh, this is a two-dimensional map of magnetic field. So downstream, it just follows density. In the upstream, you can see interesting waves that are appearing. So this is what these uh, shocks look like. You can see periodic uh, reformation of these loops. So these density is kind of a breezing structure. Uh, in front of the shocks, you have these waves, which are living typically in this returning loop of the ions. And um, the ratio of electron to ion temperature very quickly settles to about 20 percent, uh, almost right after the shock transition. So this is a, a fairly low Mach number, quite magnetized shock uh, with a transverse magnetic field, so quasi-perpendicular. Uh, this is, sorry, oops, this is a, uh, this is a uh, higher Mach number in lower magnetic field. Uh, again, quasi-perpendicular. Initially, it looked like a Weibel shock. Initially, it looked like a lot of filamentation was happening. But ultimately, it remembered that it was magnetized, and uh, it's, uh, it continues to make this uh, gyrational motions. So when, when ions start to feel the magnetic field, you see these gyrational motions. The shock proceeds with very large overshoots. So this density at the peak of the shock can be much larger than the compression uh, that MHD predicts, ultimate compression. Uh, so these kind of be become very turbulent structures. It always looks like there's a lot of action still going on near the end of the movies you're playing. Are these simulations sort of give a sense that they're getting some kind of equilibrium or some kind of dynamic order? Yeah, so at the shock, a lot of interesting things continue to happen. But overall, this becomes a self-similar structure that propagates. And what's reassuring is that after all of this crazy stuff is done, the ultimate jump conditions settle to MHD. So as they should, because energy should be conserved and momentum is conserved. So, but, but in the transition, crazy things continue to happen. Uh, and uh, you're never quite sure that you've reached steady state, especially if there are accelerated particles, because those can feed back on a longer time scale. OK, so this is what a quasi-parallel shock looks like. So initially, magnetic field along the direction of the flow. Uh, you can see this density compression. Uh, you also see this uh, reflected ions. So the ions are going back towards the upstream. Uh, they're returning and they're also driving waves. So you can see these magnetic fluctuations starting to appear uh, in front of the shock and they're creating circular polarized waves. Uh, all right, so uh, let's talk about what, uh, what accelerates these particles. So there are two crucial ingredients. First, the ability of the shock to send particles back upstream. And the second is the ability of those particles to come back. And uh, for, for this, you need to understand how the shock actually functions. For this, you need to understand how magnetic turbulence is either pre-existing or, uh, or, uh, or is created. So for, uh, to study this in more detail, we've done a lot of hybrid simulations where we just track ions uh, without uh, electrons. And um, this is work by Damiano Caprioli. Um, and Louis Gargatti, actually. So, so what you see here is uh, density through, uh, through such a shock. Uh, you can see here orbits of individual ions. And uh, you can see these wiggles. Those, those wiggles represent them gyrating around magnetic field. Uh, they're scattering off the shock initially. And uh, as they go back, they drive waves. And then they s trap on those waves, return back to the shock, and then accelerate more. Uh, and that, so that's the generic idea. So when we run this hybrid simulation for a very long time, we start seeing convergent spectrum. So what we see here is this is a spectrum in, uh, in energy. Uh, I should have plotted momentum spectrum. But uh, yeah, here's the momentum spectrum, right? Uh, what you see is that this is momentum spectrum multiplied by p to the fourth. And this is energy spectrum multiplied by appropriate factor. Uh, what you find is that over time, you get this flat power law uh, which would correspond to p to the minus 4 or e to the minus 2 for relativistic particles, uh, which grows with energy. And uh, it takes about 10% or 15% of energy from the shock, puts it into this tail. Correspondingly, the thermal Maxwellian actually cools because energy is conserved. So you, some of the energy that from here went into the tail. So we recover these predicted slopes of the uh, diffusive shock acceleration associated with it is magnetic field amplification. So as you create, as you reflect these particles going upstream, those particles are 
mostly ions here, and uh, they represent a net current that you're trying to push through the upstream medium. So as this cloud of diffusing particles rides on the shock, that's a net current. Uh, and that can drive instabilities in the upstream. Uh, one of these instabilities is called the Bell, uh, the, the non-resonant instability. There are also analogs called the resonant part, uh, where the, essentially this current of uh, particles is expelling plasma and creates holes in the plasma. So you can see here this kind of filamentation instability of the upstream. So these holes in the density, uh, they eventually impact the shock. So the shock structure becomes, the shock surface becomes corrugated. You can see all sorts of funny uh, hydrodynamic instabilities that start to occur here. Uh, and this, this corrugated shock continues to propagate. There are new holes that are being created by cosmic rays in the upstream. And uh, this motion actually amplifies magnetic field even more. And uh, <coughs> so what you see is uh, this, uh, how acceleration of particles affects the magnetic field, which in, turns, uh, in turn affects the acceleration. Uh, we can um, look at how this magnetic field amplification changes with inclination of the uh, magnetic field. So going from quasi-perpendicular, where almost nothing happens, uh, to quasi-parallel, where, where the structure is very turbulent. And uh, we can trace the uh, amount of energy you put into this amplified magnetic field and see that it's related to the uh, alphanic Mach number. So the higher the alphanic Mach number, the more energy you can put into the amplified uh, magnetic field. Uh, and uh, we also can evolve this long enough to see uh, a kind of uh, transition between diffusion and, and, uh, and escape. So this shows the magnetic field structure through the shock. Uh, this is the downstream. This is the far upstream. Uh, and this is the uh, interesting region where particles are diffusing. So here, particles are escaping towards the upstream. Here, they're diffusing around the shock. And here, there's trapped downstream. So this, there is this kind of a diffusion region which over time kind of expands out. And then at the front end, edge of it, the highest energy particles are leaking into the upstream and seeding more turbulence. And uh, we can track this by looking at what kind of uh, turbulent wave modes that are created. Either this here is over there. So the, the kind of instability that is created is different between here and there. Um, right. OK. So what is the physics of, oh, let's see. Oh, sorry, one, one more thing. Um, This. Right, so we can, uh, we've recovered the spectrum, but we can also recover, the, we, we can measure the normalization of the slope of the spectrum. And what we see is that uh, quasi-parallel shocks, uh, which are shown here in the uh, blue and green colors, accelerate quite well. And then as you go towards quasi-perpendicular shocks, you again uh, shut off the acceleration. In this case, it's not uh, really the fact that they're superluminal, uh, it's just particles are not able to accelerate in these, in these quasi-perpendicular shocks. And uh, I'll explain why this is in a second. Uh, we can measure how much energy we put into these shocks, into the accelerated uh, tails, depending on the Mach number and depending on the inclination of the flow. And what you see of, of the shock, what you see is that, again, quasi-parallel shocks are efficient accelerators. You can put 10, 15% of energy into the accelerated particles. Quasi perp shocks, they seem to die. So, why is that? Um, we've looked into more detail into how particles actually uh, get injected into this process. So, by this, we actually can track particles through the shock and ask do they, what, is, what happens to them? Do they go through? Do they reflect? What, is the, what determines their ultimate fate? And what determines their fate turns out to be the fact that the shock itself is a rather dynamic structure, it's not a steady thing. Uh, it seems to do this breathing, it's called reformation. So these, on the Larmor time scale of the incoming ions, the shock is kind of breathing uh, and reforming and jumping ahead a little bit. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> depending on when particles encounter this process, de determines whether they can be reflected or not. So uh, here is a, a, a demonstration. So we mark shells in the upstream and let those shells go through. And then uh, the color of the particles is uh, 
determined by their ultimate outcome. So the purple ones will end up in the non-thermal tail, the green ones end up in the thermal, and the orange ones are kind of in between. So <coughs> what you can see is that the purple ones really reflect nicely from the shock, and they, they go through several cycles of this kind of reflection. This is called the shock drift acceleration, where they can sample both sides of the shock within one Larmor orbit. And uh, you can see the efficiency of each shell is shown here. And now a big, uh, highly efficient shell is about to encounter the shock. So it's going to get launched in a second. So it's coming, coming up over here. Here it is. So it manages to come to the shock right at the right moment that uh, the, most of the particles get reflected. So, so shock seems to be a kind of a semiconductor. It, it you know, conducts most of the time. You know, let some particles go through most of the time, but occasionally it reflects a large fraction of them. So what is going on is that uh, this, um, uh, what's happening at the shock is that uh, there is both magnetic barrier and also electrostatic potential at the shock. So uh, as the shock oscillates, the height of this uh, magnetic barrier and electrostatic potential changes. And uh, it's uh, roughly about 25% of the time uh, <coughs> this shock is at high state, so it, it has large enough potential to reflect an incoming ion. Uh, other 75% of the time it can transmit those uh, ions. And uh, what you need is, uh, as these particles are reflected, they gain energy. And uh, what you need is for particle to uh, go through several cycles of this uh, shock drift acceleration to gain enough energy to actually outrun the shock along the magnetic field. And uh, each of these cycles is not perfect reflection. So each of these cycles gets lossy. And what happens is that uh, depending on what is the inclination of magnetic field of, uh, at the shock, you need uh, fewer or more uh, number of these uh, cycles of reflection. And uh, this determines uh, how many particles will ultimately enter the acceleration process because uh, so what happens is that at, ob at oblique shocks, um, you need uh, to reach uh, energy which is uh, like, say, 20 times the initial energy of the shock. And uh, uh, that requires, say, four or five cycles of the shock drift acceleration. At uh, 45 degree inclination, you need only three cycles of the shock drift acceleration. So uh, what you find is that uh, the uh, number of particles that remain in the yeah, it's shown here. So number of particles that uh, remain after n cycles is about 25% to the power of n. Uh, so for 45 degrees, you need about to reach about energy of 10 times the initial energy of the ion. You need about three gyrations, and that gives you an efficiency of about 1%. As you incline the shock more, the number of cycles that you need goes up, and uh, your efficiency drops. And that's kind of qualitatively why perpendicular shocks are bad accelerators. Um, and we have a more quantitative theory of this now uh, in this paper, uh, which uh, predicts uh, how many particles will go through the shock, how many particles will kind of wiggle around the shock and form a uh, super thermal tail, and how many of them will get reflected and ultimately injected into a power law. And uh, this determines the overall normalization of the, of the power law. OK, so what about electrons? Uh, let me quickly touch on those. So <coughs> the electrons um, have a problem with, uh, uh, with Larmor radius. Uh, initially, as they go through the shock, they will, they, they, their Larmor radius is much smaller than the ions. So they get, they, they get advected uh, through the shock without much uh, reflection. So this simulation shows a uh, uh, simulation of a uh, quasi-parallel shock uh, in full particle and cell simulations. Uh, what you see here is a phase space of the ions. So the ions are escaping. Uh, into the upstream driving turbulence. This is the strength of the magnetic field in front of the shock. And what you see is that over time, as this turbulence of ions uh, gets going, uh, you start seeing electrons being reflected from the shock and going towards the upstream. Uh, it turns out that these electrons are being uh, 
are being reflected because ions are changing the magnetic inclination of the shock. The turbulence that the ions are creating is strong enough to change magnetic inclination of the shock at the shock, and electrons can mirror away from strong, strong regions of magnetic field. So electrons start mirroring away, they fly back, and then they scatter on the turbulence that is created by the ions. And as a result of this, we, we can see formation of a power law in both ions and electrons. So uh, both ions accelerate and electrons accelerate, and we can measure the relative fraction. We can just divide one power law by the other, and we find that this uh, ratio is about 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 2. So for every proton, we have uh, fewer electrons, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 3 electrons accelerated. Uh, qualitatively, why this happens is because um, why electrons are less efficient is because they have to undergo these uh, lossy cycles of shock drift acceleration at the shock. So, uh, they encounter the shock, they have to do, uh, they have to sit on the shock, gain enough energy to escape into the upstream, then they can scatter on the waves generated by the ions, and they have to go back for more, etc. Each of these cycles is lossy, and uh, you, electrons have a handicap in uh, uh, getting, getting to full acceleration. So, uh, let me, I guess, skip this one. So, what we find is that, <coughs> Uh, this is our kind of incomplete survey of uh, this ratio between electrons and, and protons. Uh, of course, uh, so the reality is sitting somewhere here. This is the artificial mass ratio that we use. Uh, so reality is at 1800. Uh, what's uh, inferred from the measurements in supernova remnants is something like 10 to the minus 3. What's measured in cosmic rays is about uh, 10 to the minus 2. And we're kind of all over the place, uh, depending on, what, on some of the numerical parameters that we choose. But overall, what we find is that if we keep, uh, if we get closer to realistic mass ratios and uh, the uh, use velocities that are more relevant to supernova remnants, for us it's easier to do relativistic flows than non-relativistic flows. Uh, but if we restrain ourselves and lower the velocity, then we, we start getting into the regime of, uh, that's similar to what's observed or at least inferred in supernova remnants. Uh, the details of this process are um, still being uh, hammered out. We, there, are, there are many, so we kind of, this probes only quasi-parallel shocks. So, you know, quasi-perpendicular shocks are sort of the next frontier. Here is an example of a quasi-perpendicular shock this one doesn't accelerate protons. So protons are prohibited from escaping just because uh, of the uh, gyration dynamics. But electrons can mirror away from a quasi-perpendicular shock quite nicely. So you can see electrons escaping into the upstream. And if you wait long enough, they can actually drive their own waves. So the electrons, these uh, electrons can actually drive enough upstream turbulence to get confined and start seeing diffusive shock acceleration in electrons without the ions. So this is kind of the first uh, indication of this happening in simulations. Um, there is kind of debate in the community going on whether this actually translates uh, from 1D to 2D to 3D. Uh, it turns out that uh, uh, most of our simulations in two dimensions were done with magnetic field in plane. Turns out that there's a big difference for electrons, whether it's in plane or out of plane. For ions, in plane is more important. For electrons, it's out of plane. So what this is telling us is that we have to do 3D. And uh, uh, 3D is painful, but we, we're, uh, we're, we're going there. So um, preliminary conclusions based on this uh, is that uh, quasi-parallel shocks, uh, non-relativistic quasi-parallel shocks, they should accelerate both ions and electrons. So, Ions go first, but then they drive waves that will create uh, electron scattering and accelerate electrons. Uh, Quasi-perpendicular shocks, <coughs> from what I can see now, if they do accelerate, they accelerate electrons, and uh, probably less efficiently than quasi-parallel shocks. And uh, the... Um, this... Uh, you know, if we take it at face value, we can try to apply it to a supernova remnant and see if that makes an uh, interesting prediction. So um, <clears throat> here's an example, supernova 1006. Uh, it has these two interesting polar caps of emission. Uh, of, uh, so presumably electrons are accelerated in these shocks. 
uh, one interpretation of this picture is that there is a, a large scale magnetic field that is oriented like this, uh, which would make these regions to be quasi parallel, these regions to be quasi perpendicular. And uh, <clears throat> so what we expect to happen is that in this region, you will have strong acceleration of protons, which will drive turbulent magnetic fields, which will reflect electrons and ultimately result in electron acceleration. Over here, we would expect uh, if there is, uh, there is not much protons acceleration, not much turbulence uh, created by protons, but perhaps electrons can get accelerated maybe, maybe in a more weaker, uh, weaker way. Yes. 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 Okay. Right. So uh, there has been measurements of radio polarization uh, in uh, in this remnant, and uh, what they show is that <coughs> this uh, there is overall indication that magnetic field on average is aligned this way. So this this yellow means it aligned uh, with respect to the shock normal. Uh, so indeed, the overall large-scale magnetic field seems to do this. However, there is also a measurement of degree of polarization, and uh, uh, in these regions, you also have low degree of polarization. So that would would suggest that there is turbulent magnetic fields, even though on average this is a quasi-parallel shock. But on small scale, there are turbulent magnetic fields, which would create a lower degree of polarization than at the edges. So that's kind of uh, what uh, what is probably happening uh, in um, you know there is no really quasi parallel shock uh, they when when acceleration is very efficient they look like this uh, and uh, it's a mess so uh, there is an average inclination of magnetic field here uh, and how this how, how these kind of shocks accelerate electrons and protons is still still need, need, needs to be understood. So we, we know what they do for protons, but what they do for electrons is not completely obvious to me. Uh, to do this on scale, large enough scale to track electrons is very expensive, but uh, I think this will come. So um, I want to finish on one interesting uh, thing that we found is um, we uh, uh, just for fun try to add uh, particles that are heavier than hydrogen into our simulations. So. Um, <clears throat> heavier nuclei, there is an interesting observation in galactic cosmic rays that uh, nuclei heavier than hydrogen uh, seem to be preferentially <laughs> present in cosmic rays. So this is abundance relative to solar, and this is mass of the, of the nuclei, so hydrogen here uh, normalized to one. And uh, the abundance uh, uh, of higher uh, mass nuclei seems to be larger, uh, preferentially uh, preferred uh, in, uh, in galactic cosmic rays. Uh, what we tried to do is to put in um, particles with different charge to mass ratio. And uh, the, what you get is that uh, naturally the energy that the particles get uh, scales with their initial mass. So uh, what we see is that if we put hydrogen, helium, CNO, and iron, uh, they would just shift, uh, the energy would just shift with respect to the energy in initially in the shock just by their mass. Uh, and we don't get any artificial, uh, any enhancement in, in the efficiency of uh, injection of these species because ultimately, if they're all fully ionized, A to Z is roughly two for all elements beyond helium. Uh, so they all have roughly the same A to Z ratio. Now, uh, what we tried is that, well, if the shock is really going through an interstellar medium, let's say it's 10 to the 4 degrees Kelvin, you wouldn't expect to have iron to be completely ionized in the interstellar medium. Maybe it's singly ionized or double ionized, right? So let's consider particles with large A over Z, so incompletely ionized ions. And then magical things happen. Because then those, uh, the relative, uh, so the, the, here is this as a different uh, A over Z ratios. Uh, the peak just shifts with respect to the A, that's fine. But what we see is that the relative position of the tail uh, with respect to the maximum is also enhanced. So the injection efficiency increases for particles with larger A over Z. Yeah, they very well may, but they're already in the game, right? Uh, so <laughs> we don't track that. That's a good question. We, we should track this. But uh, the zeroth order effect is that these larger A over Z particles have larger Larmor radius. They can go through the shock uh, 
and sample both sides of the shock uh, easier. And uh, indeed, what we find is that uh, the uh, relative e efficiency of injection of these uh, particles of large A over Z scales like A over Z squared up to some maximum. And uh, so what's plotted here is what we get from simulations and the relative uh, efficiency enhancement in observations. And uh, you know, on the log scale, they seem to follow each other. Uh, I, there are a thousand other effects that can contribute to this. Cosmic ray business is a little dirty. But uh, this is a simple, uh, uh, simple idea of just whether the injection by itself is biased towards these, these kinds of particles. Uh, so this, this just shows uh, different species, so hydrogen, deuterium, and helium. And uh, you can see that the hydrogen reflects and starts to accelerate quite nicely. Uh, deuterium and helium almost don't care about it. Uh, and eventually, uh, you start seeing some of the reflections from helium, some of the deuterium. Eventually, all of them join diffusive shock acceleration. Uh, but uh, the fact that the helium samples uh, large uh, uh, regions upstream and the downstream makes it more efficient uh, in, in the reflection. And that ultimately, this forms a more pronounced power law for helium than, uh, than for hydrogen. OK, so uh, let me conclude. <coughs> yeah, this movie needs to run a little faster. Um, OK, trust me, this will eventually build, <laughs> build a larger tail. Um, Right, so conclusion is that uh, we have seen uh, diffusive shock acceleration from first principles in these kinds of simulations. Uh, we can uh, understand now the why particles get injected into this process, and uh, we can constrain the fraction of particles that gets injected. Uh, we find that magnetization uh, is important in setting both the shock structure and also its inclination determines the shock acceleration efficiency. And uh, we can see uh, acceleration of both <laughs> ions and electrons. We can measure the relative efficiency between them. Uh, this ratio of 10 to the minus 3 seems to be naturally recovered. The caveat is that so far it's been recovered in 1D. Whether this per persists in 2D or 3D, we've yet to understand. Uh, the electron acceleration seems to proceed quite well in quasi-perpendicular shocks. but. Uh, the efficiency is probably lower than uh, an ions at quasi-parallel shock, so the efficiency may be uh, smaller than 10% or so. Uh, and by number, it's smaller than 1%. And now we're finding these interesting uh, indications that incompletely ionized ions can be uh, efficiently injected into the acceleration spectrum. So thank you. Did I say more? Energy is several percent, number less than one percent. Oh, doesn't that mean they're more? Um, Sorry, so the ions have 10, 20 percent of energy. Yes. Electrons have less than one percent. But, right. but, right. but the electrons, yeah. as compared to the right. electrons, are the quasi. Yeah, I think they're. Shock yeah. More okay, I wouldn't go there. I, I, there, there could be. At, at face value, they're probably comparable. But um, I, this is comparing two-dimensional simulations with one-dimensional simulation. I, I'm not, not convinced they can do that. So to get, uh, sorry, to, to get this one, uh, we had to collapse the transverse dimension. So. Because um, pick simulations are expensive, right? So if you want to do, uh, like, like this run was one dimensional. Yeah. So we can do three, three components of velocity, but, but it's one dimensional in space. Uh, in 2D, this may change. Uh, I hope it doesn't, but it may. But it's becoming feasible now that you have 
had shock states come over real supernova shock states. That's right. Yes. That's 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 what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. That's almost, and that's too little sense. So when you see these loops in a typical supernova, it would be actually the spatial and time scale associated. Oh, this, this, these are gyration. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. gyration of the again, just the half sense of the time and space. These are probably minutes. Minutes. Yeah. Yes. So in modern simulations, do the non-travel tail connect smoothly to the maximum distribution? Yes. Observation because in observation is the uh, let's point out that the uh, minimum energy for the high energy tail is uh, larger by orders of magnitude in terms of energy from the um, energy. I think I think that's because your 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 the observations are um, in a particular band, right? And you you normally don't see the whole spectrum. Right. But if uh, you just take just use minimum energy considerations to strain the. Uh, um, minimum energy for the low, for the long term, mm -hmm. even that gives you um, energy much larger than the thermal energy. Well, they have to come from somewhere, right? So th w there may be a change in the slope at some point. So I, I you know, the, the point is that <laughs> we have to grow from the thermal. We can't just start somewhere in the middle of nowhere, right? So as we grow from the thermal, we have to connect to the thermal. Uh, what I can't rule out is that the slope changes above certain energy, right? So as maybe nonlinear effects become more important, maybe maybe the slope will change. Uh, but in these in these simulations, we have to start from the thermal. Uh, let's think and totally end.